and we launched our first city, St. John's Bay, on the Caribbean island of Roatan. It's a beautiful destination for remote workers, tech startups, um, entrepreneurs. And the interesting thing about uh, our platform is it allows us to scale and serve multiple cities. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Remotely Serious. I'm here with Jay Robertson, the VP of Development at Prospera in Honduras, and Nicholas Ansinger, who is the general partner at Infinita VC or Infinita Fund. And they are, we actually organized this podcast when I reached out to both of you independently, and both of you kind of said, wouldn't it be, you know, an interesting podcast if we had each other, if you had each other on the podcast. So I think this is officially our first uh, panel podcast, but Jay, Nicholas, uh, welcome to the pod. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to be here. Thanks. So I'll start with Prospera. Um, and again, I'm an Anglo, so I may be saying this not in, in not perfect Honduran Spanish, but Prospera or Prospera uh, is a, uh, is it fair to say, Jay, that it is a, a network state or a startup city? How do you pitch this project, if I can call it that, when you're pitching to stakeholders? It's a great question. Um, Prospera at its core is a platform for governance. And what we provide is a special governance framework and as a company, we partner with governments to create special economic zones. And inside those zones, new cities can be built. And so the core thing that we're providing is a, a better way of doing governance. And we partner with countries to leverage that, to drive growth and development and create beautiful destinations for entrepreneurs and innovators. And we've partnered with Honduras to build our first flagship city, St. John's Bay, on the island of Roatan. Yeah, I was looking at the website uh, in preparation for this call. You, you uh, promote multiple cities. I guess maybe uh, St. John's Bay is the first one. When you have this concept of St. John's Bay, and it looks like Satuye and Port Royal, what, what, I what are those other cities as well? How do they fit within... Uh, so, so what I gather is Prospera is a is a stack of technology, but it's also unlike some philosophical startup city projects that are going on right now. The the overall Prospera technology stack and project and the city of St. John's Bay. This is this is real stuff happening. Atoms, not bits. Buildings, land, people coming. It's it's a real physical place. So, what are those three cities on your website? How does that relate? Uh, how do they relate to the overall project? Yeah, so you're right that what, what sets Prosper apart from a lot of projects is we've been working on this for a while. And uh, we had the idea um, and, and partnered with Honduras to start because they have one of the best legal frameworks in the world that allows for private partners to come in and set up a special jurisdiction. So Prosper was one of three companies that got approved under the Zeti law in Honduras. And we launched our first city, St. John's Bay, on the Caribbean island of Roatan. It's a beautiful destination for remote workers, tech startups, um, entrepreneurs. And the interesting thing about uh, our platform is it allows us to scale and serve multiple cities under that same jurisdiction in Honduras. So like a city, a normal city can annex other properties and expand their borders. The unique thing about the Honduran law, it allows us to do that by adding non-contiguous properties. So the first flagship is St. John's Bay. It's the most developed. Satuye is an industrial hub on the uh, mainland of Honduras with access to a port facility. Um, it's in early development uh, and is, is suited towards more heavy manufacturing or industrial uses. And then Port Royal um, is in the very early planning stages, but it's actually on the eastern end of the island of Roatan. So it's a, it's a separate community there on the island. Um, got it. And I've got more, definitely more questions about, uh, about Prosper. But Nicholas, I want to bring you in. Infinita, it's, it's um, on your website. It says, uh, I think it says, you know, proudly based in Prosper or based in Prosper under the, actually there's kind of, uh, uh, <laughs> people should go, go check it out. There's kind of this, um, futuristic looking or neo-futuristic looking hero banner picture. Um, I'm really curious what makes you, you know, what is the appeal of basing 
in Prospera for any company, but specifically, I guess, for a VC fund. And then another, another thing I'm really curious about is what is the model of a VC fund that's focused on this space? Obviously, you are, um, you know, uh, bullish on on Prospera. But when I think about cities and civilizations and network states, it seems to me these are the kinds of things that take tw 10, 20, 30 years. If we look at human history, you know, how long does it take to get a city off the ground? It's not something you flip in 18 months or, you know, pass the bag on to the IPO market or, you know, find the next Series B growth investor and kind of, you know, wipe your hands and say, hey, we did it. We got it from Series A to Series C. These are really, really big ideas. And so I'm curious how you got into this particular vertical, if we can call it that, the, the network state vertical. And then how does a VC firm even look, you know, approach a thesis for this emerging space? Sure, that's a very wide-ranging question <laughs> and, and a deep rabbit hole to go down. <laughs> so I could give a very long answer. The short answer is why I'm based in Prospera is that I think it's uh, by far the best and most advanced startup society in the century to date with the highest possible leverage or optionality for technology startups to innovate in areas that desperately need innovation, right? That are currently held back by the flawed regulatory paradigm, even in developed countries like the United States. So that's the short answer. Uh, the longer answer is that I, I, I kind of answer with my story of how I got started there. So I also a serial entrepreneur. I come from the Berlin tech startup scene. I had two, I did two startups. So I was an early employee and operator, and one of them was quite successful, raised a series B. At that point I left and wanted to start my own startups. And the first one didn't work. Um, and I was looking for what is the, what are the biggest possible problems or what's the biggest possible mission I can go on, right? What's a problem that can keep me occupied for the rest of my life. And I looked into things like healthcare during COVID. And there's also things like real estate, like finance. I felt I was a bit too late because crypto was already having a good run, um, but also energy or climate. But when I looked deeper into all these, and especially healthcare, what I found was that the problems in these sectors are not due to like mark lack of market-based solutions or options, right? It's very often that you can't build a better solution because um, of the problem of regulatory and legal systems, right? So that's very apparent in countries where it's very hard to do business in the first place, like Honduras, where you have like a very predatory financing in environment and lack of private property rights enforcement and things like that. And in countries like the United States, it goes into things like housing regulation, which is destroying trillions of dollars in value and really driving housing prices up artificially right, by building supply constraints. So, so that was the mind space where I was coming from. And I was like, as an entrepreneur, how do you fix that? I can't really fix regulations, right? I'm, I'm, I can't make laws, right? And I don't want to lobby left for like 20 years. They have like a tiny chance to get some proposal uh, into, into law. And then I heard about Prospera really through Scott Alexander, who wrote this long article, Prospectus on Prospera. And I was just fascinated and intrigued, but also skeptical, like, can this be real? Or is this like some, you know, some vague utopian or philosophical uh, project, right? So I went to visit it in April, 2022. And even though I was already excited about the idea, visiting made it so viscerally real. Like this is already happening. This is like very practical. There's a really capable team. It has really good funding. There's real estate, there's the better building, the co-working space is on a beautiful Caribbean paradise island. I was like, wow, what's happening? <laughs> and also at the same time, I saw startups, for example, a startup called Mini Circle, which is doing gene therapy. They're working with the local clinic to do clinical trials or a drone technology company. That, so they're building, a, they have a drone platform on top of the first residential tower where you can get things delivered by a drone. So I was like, wow, this is happening. And now there's so many things that are possible. And there was a pitch competition at that first, at that first summit that I organized. And I was like, I can't possibly decide which of all these ideas I want to work on now. So I pitched a VC fund. So I don't have to decide. I can just help others realize their ideas. And Eric Brimmon, the CEO of Prospera, liked that idea. And he said, what do you need? Uh, we want to help you realize that. 
And then I started seriously looking into it and actually doing it. And I think I positioned Infinita at quite a good sweet spot, right? Because um, I, I, I just decided to have normal Delaware fund entities, right? So the fund is incorporated in Delaware, right? So it basically has the risk profile of the entity of a normal US-based VC fund. Right. And I'm investing in companies that can use Prosper and places like Prosper that get some advantage of it. Like it's a strategic optionality. So don't require people to come here. It's just a bonus for me or I get additional insight on them as a company. And I just see or notice what advantage they get through it. So this also allows me to capture a larger deal flow. Right. So companies in like biotech and healthcare in drones and air mobility or in like legal and crypto, they're all in candidates for me if they fit the profile of they could, Prosper could give them a big advantage or some other jurisdictions that I work with. So this like really diversified the risk of the fund in a way, right? So I was able to go to investors that have invested in like Prosper or in similar projects and considered a very high risk investment and say like, hey, you could help that project, but with a much lower risk profile, with the risk profile of a normal VC fund. And then I could go to founders and have like a really interesting and relevant story that many of them I invited to the island and some of them are intrigued to getting set up and doing clinical trials or getting like testing sites. It's a jetpack company that came through me. So a uh, long winded way of saying that the thesis has really landed in the market. So the fund is well oversubscribed mm -hmm. now and, uh, and that's quite exciting. I met 14 investments by now, two of which are prosper based companies. Um, several others are considering though. So I expect in the final portfolio, maybe four to six out of them will be, will be companies that have some operations in Prospera. And at the same time, I also started diversifying, right? So I want to create a larger movement, right? So Prospera, I think has a bigger chance of succeeding if there's more projects like it, right? Because, um, this way you're not like this single target, right? Others are doing it. So this has legitimacy and credibility. So I started working with some other projects, for example, the, with Zuzalu, um, Vitalik Buterin's pop-up city in Montenegro, where we also got into um, talks with the government, who's open to do special economic loans like that. And another one, Zanzibar, which has two projects that got like custom deals for special economic zones. And the government is interested in doing, doing more of these zones. So I want to create kind of a bigger movement that is helping these startups succeed in all these areas where we need that innovation and that disruption that is currently not happening because existing like legacy systems don't, don't allow it. Jay, uh, how was, um, I'm, I'm thinking about all these different industries that Nicholas is mentioning and where it might be favorable for them to be uh, in in Prospera or or in in the uh, the first um, iteration of Prospera in in St John's or on Roatan, how did you choose, or how was Honduras chosen as the first country for this model, and what specifically about the the island of Roatan was attractive for creating this uh, special economic zone or ZA, and how did that come about? It's a good question because Honduras is not always at the top of people's lists when they're looking at new places to travel to. Um, I'll, I'll start by answering that um, by just touching on, on our philosophy generally. As, as Nicholas mentioned, we've seen a, a real growth in, in projects where people are trying to create network states, startup societies, special economic zones. And for us, we look at governance as an industry. That's not something that's not the typical way that people think about governments. You think about government as a fixed thing that you're stuck with. And if you want to change the rules, you have to go through the traditional legislative process. It's expensive. It's hard. And it's just really difficult to drive change at the institutional level. So if you think about governance as an industry, it captures a huge percentage of GDP. It's highly concentrated and inefficient. There were around 200 providers for over 7 billion customers in the world. Um, most people are dissatisfied with the way their government works. And so you're paying a lot of fees for services that don't always work. And our, our thesis is we can drive change by one, offering a better alternative, doing governance better, providing it as a service that people can opt into, where it's very clear what fees you're paying and what services you get in exchange for those fees. So we can not only offer a better alternative 
But as we know, competition in markets drive improvements across the entire sector. So the hope is that Prospera and more projects like Prospera show a better way of doing governance that also drives change at these other legacy institutions. So when we started approaching the project through that lens, you, you see that there are successful examples of special economic zones that have driven prosperity and economic growth in other parts of the world. Places like Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Dubai, Singapore are some of the big examples of these places that were, in, in the case of Shenzhen, a small fishing village that is now this gigantic thriving industrial hub. And prosperity can be driven at the city scale like that through just better institutions. That was the secret sauce for all these places. It was a special environment with better rules that provide good governance, security, stable rule of law, property rights, and access to justice. But you'll notice that most of those that I mentioned are not in the Western Hemisphere. They're, they're in the, the Far East. And so Prospera started looking at somewhere in the Western Hemisphere. And coincidentally, there were some leaders in Honduras that were seeking to create these kind of zones because they realized that Honduras is a poor country, needs foreign direct investment, and needs jobs to keep Hondurans at home. Currently, Honduras sees massive migration to the United States for primarily people seeking economic opportunity. The, the key distinction in Honduras and the reason we're there is because they created this law called the Zede Law that is really unique in that most of those other zones are directly administered by the central government. Honduras realized they didn't have the capital to set up one of those themselves or the expertise to manage it in a way that would really welcome foreign investment. So they allow private companies to come in and set up and manage the zone privately and for profit. So it was really appealing. We, we started looking at Honduras. And then within Honduras, there are lots of potential locations. Roatan has a huge number of advantages. As Nicholas mentioned, it's an island off the northern coast of Honduras. It's about 30 square miles. Um, it's roughly equivalent to the size of Hong Kong Island. And has a population of around 100,000 people. It's a former British colony, large bilingual population. Uh, U.S. dollars are widely accepted. And they see a huge number of, of tourists that visit the island every year for scuba diving and snorkeling. It's very accessible from the U.S. There are direct flights daily to the island from airports like Houston and Miami. It's two or three hour flight direct to the island and then a 15 minute drive to, to the St. John's Bay. And so there were just a huge number of advantages that made it clear to us that within Honduras, Roatan was the place to start. Uh, coincidentally, we, we, we started in early 2020 when we put up our website um, and said, we're, we're open for business. That was in the middle of, of COVID when all of a sudden people, many more people were all of a sudden unshackled from their desks and had the options to choose where they could work. And so we're presenting an option where you can not only choose where you work, you can choose a jurisdiction that is really optimized for entrepreneurship and growth. Jay or Nicholas, I guess, I'm just, I've got this um, even better picture now of the the kind of uh, almost like the paradise feel of an island where people go scuba diving, but there's also this uh, this new economic concept that's that's spurring a lot of economic growth. I'm wondering, Nicholas, you mentioned that, you know, you've set up a Delaware Corp for the fun, but of course the, the, um, the benefit for companies going to uh, Prospera is that they will be able to do things like drones and gene therapy where they might encounter regulatory hurdles in the United States or in other parts of the world. Do you do you foresee that this um, genesis of the company in a friendly environment for experimenting with new technologies is something that companies will use to see the entire life of their company, or is it something where you might start your company in uh, in Prospera or, or or in Honduras, and then at a certain point, you know, maybe Series C, Series D, it's like. Well, we got off the ground faster because we were here, but now we kind of need to go and start an office in Ireland or in the United States or in New York, you know, somewhere and kind of grow up and, and graduate to somewhere else. Or is it something where the ecosystem is intending to support companies for 10 years, 20 years, even growing unicorns and corporate headquarters 
um, once they mature. Obviously, with the eye towards, you know, at a certain point, you might get the uh, the counter argument that like, oh, if I'm going to do enterprise sales, I want to be, you know, based in Atlanta or, you know, or I want to be based in London or, or something like that. How, how is the uh, the future? How does the future look for companies that succeed at getting off the ground? Will they stay there for a long time or, or do they kind of use it as an incubator for going somewhere else? Yeah. So both are entirely legitimate use cases, using it as an incubator or using it as a place for a headquarter. I would say the advantage as a place for a headquarter would be if you're in something like healthcare, for example. Right. So I think medical tourism is a massive opportunity that we're that we're tapping into with what we're doing in Prospera for that. I think it could have huge advantages to be very close to what we're doing here. Um, once we're able to build like density of like clinics, um, so we sort of have a more clear regulatory structure for, you know, safety clinical trials. So I think there's tremendous opportunity to build like a density at that location. Um, for other companies like crypto or hard hardware, for example, is a case where it's more of a launch pad. Right, so the circular factory or a jetpack company that I invested in or the drone startups, they need to internationalize. They need access to bigger markets. Right. So um, but it could also scale through Prospera, right? So it could also be that Honduras is an interesting market and they have access through that. It could be that Prospera gets another location in another country where they could get access to a bigger market. So these are all options that are easy to combine. Right. And one way how I would think about it, if you're an aspiring startup founder or entrepreneur is um, so multinational company, think of a multinational company, right? So you have different, you know, you have a headquarter, you have subsidiaries in different countries. Um, you just want to become a multinational companies potentially earlier. And I think through technology, the stack to becoming a multinational company is reduced in costs. Right, because most of it is software, right? So how you, you know, file your documents and who you send them to for regulatory compliance and things like that, that can be solved through AI. And that combined with network states and startup cities giving you additional options just allows you to become a multinational company from much cheaper and much earlier in real process. So that means you can leverage different jurisdictions for what you're doing, right? So think of small modular nuclear reactors, for example. So for that, you want to do that, right? These small jurisdictions are super interesting for you to get like to market really quick and then use that as something to show other or bigger jurisdictions. Hey, I have all this like track record and safety data, right? And here's how the regulatory templates look, you know, just if you, do you want it or not, should I like reduce your energy prices with a very high safety profile or not, right? So that's how, that's the future that I want to create. Jay, I'm just wondering, your role as VP of development, uh, how much of that role, which I imagine, of course, is, is, a, is a very sales-focused position, how much of that is finding the next Jetpack company to come and start at Prospera versus um, exporting the model and talking to the Zuzalos and the other governments of the world and p potentially, you know, what's happening three, five years down the road in other parts of the world? How much are you focused inward versus exporting and you know bring people in versus kind of bringing the model out yeah so the the one thing that i think we found in in our experience at building prospera and partnering with honduras to deploy it there is that actually getting a jurisdiction that is legitimate and operates under a sovereign government with legitimate authority is very hard right it takes it takes a lot of work um Honduras passed their initial, uh, the, the ZA law in 2013. Um, we worked for four years with the government to get the Prospera ZA charter approved in 2017. And then I mentioned in 2020 is when we actually completed the setup of the entire legal system. And so you're looking at, you know, the better part of a decade spent actually getting through that process. Now, hopefully it, it, it can be quicker in some other places, but that's a long process, but at the end of it, you, you have something really valuable, which is a place you can be in the real world operating as a, a, a sovereign government um, within the sovereign government of Honduras. And so we, we, what Prosper provides uh, primarily for those other groups or network states that are more dispersed, that don't have that relationship with the government, we provide a real world base 
for those groups. And so uh, we partner with with Dells, with with network states that are looking to host a meetup to have a a location, a physical hub within within Prospera in Roatan. And then we have also just a much wider network of people that that we call our city builders network. And these are people who are from all over the world, but are interested in building something new um, in governance or leveraging the, the governance platform that Prosper has to build their next big project. And so uh, my role specifically is to support the, the growth of that network and ensure that those people can, can use Prosper to actually build their vision. And so, you know, when we think about sales, it's, it's very different than your traditional sales structure. Um, yes, at the end of the day, we're focused on bringing people to Roatan that can use Prospera. And it's, it, it's less of a, um, a, of a customer base, I guess you'd say, as, as more of a partner ecosystem. So we have an ecosystem of businesses, um, individuals who are part of the community that are building a company, whether that's providing medical services or gene therapy or, or jet packs, as, as Nicholas mentioned, um, but then also a group of builders who are pursuing individual projects uh, that contribute to the growth of the city. And so that's something really unique that we can also provide is a, a platform for people to, to, to build a venture that contributes to the growth of the city. So if you think about those other examples, uh, imagine if you were able to uh, work with the government of Hong Kong as they were initially setting up and looking to really grow, I mean, you're getting in on the ground floor of building a new city. And as opposed to doing or managing all those projects when it comes to infrastructure and needed city services, as opposed to managing all that um, ourselves, we've opened that up to the City Builders Network. And so we have people uh, from around the world that are pursuing those things. We ha- we're we working with a builder in Australia who's helping us build a 3D property rights system. Uh, folks from, from Europe that are, that are setting up uh, me- medical services. And so um, that's, our, our approach is, is less about, you know, really selling and being transactional. We're, what we're building is a community and an ecosystem where people can contribute. And it's not just about putting forward an idea that then Prosper uses to develop. We're allowing people to pursue these as entrepreneurial ventures where they not only participate and fill the need, but keep the upside for themselves. And it's been really amazing to see that community continue to grow um, as more people come to Roatan and experience for themselves, but also people who might never come but want to participate in some way. The City Builders Network allows us to do that in a way um, where people can contribute from anywhere in the world. If I may add something to that, Curtis? Yes, of course. So I see this emerging distinction. Um, I like to call it network society, not network state, because nobody wants to build a state, um, except for Lieberland, maybe, right? And that's a bit more controversial, uh, but they're like a single case. Um, So network societies, I see vertical network societies and horizontal network societies. So a vertical network society is someone like Prospera. Right, so they're building the governance, the legal stack, sort of the jurisdictional aspect, and, and in the build world, right? So, mm-hmm. Praxis would be another one. That are, or they're explicitly aiming to build a city, or Tipolis, for example. And then I see the emergence of like horizontal network societies. So Zuzalu is a bit more of a horizontal network society, and I'm starting a new horizontal network society called Vitalia. Right, so Vitalia has like one core moral innovation. We want to make death optional, right? So in the Balagian sense, having this moral innovation. And then we'd, it would be um, too much for us to build a city, right? So we wouldn't be focused on sort of accelerating life extension technologies, which is what we actually want to do. We want to bring like entrepreneurs and bioscientists, right? Sort of that um, have been able to, that are able to figure out how to make us live longer, like through interventions such as gene therapy, right? So we really want to optimize for that, so for that one or moral innovation or for that one layer and just buy the governance services of an existing um, vertical network society provider like Prospera, right? So the first Vitalia camp, which will be similar to Zuzalu. In fact, one of the core organizers of Zuzalu, Lawrence Ayan from Vita Dao and I are co-founders in this. 
will take place in Prospera, right? So, and we're planning to, if we have the consent of the community, to build like a longevity district in Prospera, where we can, you know, do medical tourism, where we can do more clinical trials and things like that, where we can just accelerate our moral innovation further. And then we might buy access um, or governance services from other providers. So we might go to somewhere like Uruguay, for example, where the production costs are really low for biopharma. And then we might have another hub in you know, San Francisco or Austin, where we want to recruit some of the best talent in the world, right? So from the major universities, or we, where, we want to do, where we want to do fundraising because all the VCs are there. So this way we would be an archipelago of like three to five different jurisdictions. But again, it's not focused on building the city like Prosper is. We're focused on building like a horizontal industry. And to be clear, uh, you mentioned a, a kind of a Balagian organizing principle. And in his philosophy, he gives the example of, you know, maybe Bitcoin is the currency or low carb ketogenic eating is the, you know, it's an anti-sugar, uh, anti-refined sugar. Um, is it fair to say, just to make sure that I picked up what you were saying correctly, that Vitalia's organizing principle is a, is a focus on pursuing longevity? Is that that the exactly but directive? there's different kinds of longevity right so vitalik buterin once said there's kale longevity steak longevity and metformin longevity <laughs> right so kale longevity is like really healthy eating of greeneries <laughs> and the yeah. next steak longevity is like carnivore diet and like working out really hard or whatever and then metformin longevity is probably more our thing right so we really talk about radical life extension Right. So we want to use the best available science in the world, which has found interesting pathways to stop or to eventually rejuvenate cells and cell degeneration. Right. So we have we know we are aware of the problems we need to solve. Right. So there can be solutions how we can prevent people from aging and potentially live for hundreds or maybe thousands of years. Right. So we're really in that camp where we want to work on really deep science and technology and build like medical treatments and medical drugs and bring them to market in effective ways or treat patients in an effective way so they live much longer than they do now. So um, I'm just thinking about uh, your example of, you know, the, the, the horizontal example. So you can launch, you know, some aspect of what you're doing in Honduras. You can pull some, uh, you know, co cost of goods sold or, or some unit economics are favorable in Uruguay and then the talents in San Francisco. Um, when you uh, were in Zuzalu uh, or, or when you were in Montenegro to participate in Zuzalu, do you get the sense that... Um, dozens of dozens of these are going to pop up in the next 10 years or you know thinking a little bit about what jay was saying is it the kind of thing where it's really hard <laughs> it's really hard to find a host or partner symbiotic partner government and we can expect maybe five or ten of these that are actually successful but probably not 50 or 100 i'm trying to just kind of uh make it make no, it i think the anchor that have yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we have the ingredients to make this a successful movement or trend where we see more and more popping up. Like I've started collecting the different projects on like in the startup societies map that you find on my Substack, right? So the Substack is called Stranded Technologies, like my podcast, and it's just been growing and growing, right? So I think it's now at about like fifty projects or something like that. And I just released the latest version like four weeks ago, and I found like twelve more projects since then. Right. So um, yeah. it gives you a sense that this is really fast growing. That said, it does hinge on success. Right. So this is also why I'm so bullish on Prospera. Prospera is to me the most important one to succeed. So we can point at a really successful example like this. How this is how it could work to then inspire the others to say, hey, this worked in Honduras. Right. Despite at times even unfavorable conditions. And now we see how we can make it work. We can, take, we can tell other governments, look Honduras, look at how much economic development and prosperity they got from it. And here's kind of the legal templates and things how we've done it. So we could do it in this and that way with you as well. So I think that success case is really important. But if we don't have that, or if there, that, that could set the space also back by a couple of years, right? I don't think it will get it set it fully back because it's very important and needed. Right? And special economic zones are also nothing new. 
right? So as SJ has pointed out, there are numerous examples. So, uh, but I think there's a lot that hinges on the success of Prospera and, or if at least of some, or, and of some other projects as well to continue on that growth trajectory. Yeah, Jay, I'm, I'm sure since 2013, every step of the way, every milestone, this is, this is a really difficult kind of entrepreneurship because you're just pioneering an entirely new concept. Um, it seems like last year there was, you know, I'm sure after a series of many, many hurdles, there seemed to be a big hurdle in the news, which is that the the government or the the new government um, started to entertain or pass legislation in 2022 and into 2023 that wasn't as friendly to, uh, I guess, the you know the prior deal that the ZA had or Prospera had with um, the prior government when you started. What is the, can you characterize, you know, what is the nature of the current situation with some of the stuff that's been in the news about uh, perhaps the the president not being favorable to ZAs or to Prosper's experiment? And, and what have you been working on on that front in the last year or two? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that the this concept in Honduras is a Honduran idea that was pioneered by Honduran political leaders who saw it as a pathway to bringing investment and growth to the country. And they also realized that not just Honduras, but Latin America broadly is, does not have a reputation for political stability, and that it would be really important to set up the special economic zone structure in a way that has stability, that is durable, um, even in the face of a potential changeover administration or a potential instability down the road. And the way that they did that is uh, to allow the Zalms to create legal stability agreements and become party to international treaties. So as a U.S.-based company that is the organizer of this Zalm um, in, in Honduras, Prospera is party to CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement, to which the United States and Honduras are party. Uh, that protects uh, the the. Prosper zone as an existing zone for a minimum period of 50 years, even if the law is ends up being repealed down the road. And so the, the government that put this into place previously was right of political center. Uh, they were replaced by a government that was left of political center that campaigned against everything the previous government did. Stop me if you've heard this story before. It plays <laughs> out like this in multiple places. And uh, that included the, the concept of ZAs. And it became a bit of a political football during the campaign. There were lots of allegations that ZAs were used to steal property or become havens for international criminals. None of that was based in fact, and none of that's actually happened. And um, so when the new government was elected, uh, they, they continued a, using a lot of that rhetoric and took some action legislatively to repeal the enabling legislation. What that means legally uh, for the time being it only means that no new zones can be created in Honduras. So as one of the existing zones, Prospera continues to enjoy those legal stability protections, and the Congress has not taken any further action to uh, repeal the constitutional amendment that, that protects that. Um, they have until January of next year to take further action there. It doesn't appear that that's going to be the case. Uh, the current administration doesn't have a lot of um, political support currently. but. There, there is still some of that rhetoric out there. And the reality is that this is something that happens whenever new projects come. People feel threatened, it threatens special interests. Um, to use Roatan as an example, Roatan is a huge tourist destination with two cruise ship docks. Um, so Carnival cruises, rural Caribbean cruises uh, stop there regularly. That wasn't the case a few decades ago. And when the cruise ship docks were first installed, there was a huge outcry locally about all this fear about how cruise ships were going to destroy the island. And fast forward to now when it's the, the centerpiece of the local economy, and you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that, that doesn't want to see the cruise ships stopping in Roatan. And so I think we're just in that initial phase where um, there was some uncertainty at first, but now more and more people are seeing the benefits, the jobs and the growth that are brought by Prospera. We have over a thousand residents and e-residents. The majority of those are Honduran. Um, over a thousand Hondurans have jobs within the jurisdiction. So we're over one percent of the local population that's now directly or indirectly impacted by the growth that Prospera has brought. And so I think as as time goes on, you'll only see that that um, more locals are understanding the benefits and actually benefiting from the jurisdiction itself. 
And so we're we're very bullish. Um, we are continuing to see more and more interest, not only locally, but from international companies that are coming. And I think it's just a matter of time as as time passes and people see that the jurisdiction does, in fact, have this legal stability It's continuing to operate um, for the most part as normal and, and welcome new growth. I'm wondering, uh, I kind of want to take a slightly different, um, I, I think we've got a good kind of overall picture of the um, the purpose of the project, but I kind of want to make it make it personal and kind of dive down to the street level almost, so to speak. So I'm just trying to, uh, the way I'm thinking of doing it is just kind of imagining, let's say uh, myself and a co-founder or just myself, you know, we, we just raised a $500,000 safe from an investor uh, for a let's just say for a, uh, a Web3 technology project. Web3 Web and at the intersection of Web3 and AI, we are totally sold on, on Prospera. And so we book a flight to, uh, to the airport, to RTB Airport, Juan Manuel Galvez Airport. We land, we're 100% sold, and we're, we're just so eager. So we, we just like get on a plane and fly down. What's next? Like we get in the taxi. Are there kind of special accommodations? Are there condos? Is there like a... A, a main office to go and incorporate like literally we're just we're flush with safe money we're ready to go what does the next week or month look like if we're like we're all in we want to do it here what do we do next if i may start and then jay can finish so i highly recommend that you choose as states some of the conferences that infinitas organizing <laughs> the next yeah. one that's on web3 and crypto is in november three to five <laughs> Right. Yeah. So during that time, we do like a pitch competition. We'll see several parts of the jurisdiction. It will take place in the Bitcoin Education Center on the island. So during that time, you'll also get to learn much about the jurisdiction. You meet all the leadership and you meet other hungry entrepreneurs and you'll get to start thinking and developing kind of your ideas and practical ways how you can incorporate or use the jurisdiction for your purposes. So these are highly recommended. The other one is November 17 to 19. If you're interested in healthcare and longevity as well and then next year we do a whole two months focused on longevity but longevity is also heavily influenced by crypto right so it is an out and a spin-off of suzalu as well so there'll be a lot of crypto ai and other frontier technologies as well and you we have like a full camp there for two months and i'll let jay talk a bit more about um, the street level view yeah well even yeah jay i i mean i'm even thinking at a very practical level, just kind of the basics, um, e even the fact that like, let's say I'm a Canadian citizen, I am, or an American citizen or an EU citizen. Uh, is there a visa path or is there like a six month, you know, kind of nomad visa where it's like, hey, don't worry, just just come here. You won't have to pay income tax. You're allowed to be here. It's not just kind of, you know, the way that people go wink, wink, I'm going to go to a country for a year and I might just fly under the radar in Argentina or, or something. What's like the, the right way to come? for someone who's not a Honduran citizen at all or has never been? Yeah, so I would say that, you know, the, the great thing about Prospera is that we're not shackled by the traditional way of doing things. And so you can actually start that process before you even get on your flight to Roatan. Uh, you can sign up for e-residency online. Um, generally within 24 to 48 hours, you'll receive a residency card uh, that you can view online. You can add it to your Apple wallet. And um, that allows you to access uh, the Prosper Zone for up to six months out of the year. Um, and you can also incorporate your company online. All that's completely digital first. And so the benefit of starting from scratch is that we're able to reimagine how governance services work, make it super simple and low friction. Uh, once you arrive, um, you, there's visa-free access for people from US, Canada, many other countries uh, to Honduras. And you know, you you land at the airport. It's a 15 minute drive to our property. You show your residency card on your phone to, to get into the jurisdiction. Um, and then we have a, an expansive property. Uh, right now, the footprint is a little over 400 acres uh, for St. John's Bay there. It includes um, some commercial buildings, beautiful co working spaces that were purpose built by Prospera to integrate with the natural environment that have won architectural awards. Uh, we also have a large resort property with uh, standalone villas, uh, a hotel uh, with beachfront access, a large beach club with pools. And so it's a, it's a very welcoming environment to live, work, and play. And um, what is the length of time that someone 
who has got successfully got an e residency can stay before they need to renew or uh, renew, I guess, renew their their visa in in Honduras or I guess in your economic zone. Yeah, so it's an important distinction that Prospera e residency is separate and distinct from Honduran residency. Mm-hmm. And so um, Honduran residency, or generally you can come for, for three months uh, visa access. Um, you can actually obtain residency um, through investment, um, and it's, it's a v- relatively low barrier. We have preferred providers that can help walk you through that process. Honduras is generally very welcoming um, towards you know, entrepreneurs or people who are, who are looking to visit the country. So um, it's, it's very straightforward, um, and, and being a Prospera e-resident gives you access to not just the physical jurisdiction, but then all those governance services, the tax rates, the regulatory system as well. That's that's really helpful. Yeah, I think uh, ease, uh, frictionlessness, and ease of getting things started is going to be really important for all of these projects. Um, uh, Nicholas, I was just uh, even thinking about maybe the other end of the story. Now, imagine let's just say there's some entrepreneurs that came and got started, and they really just hit it out of the park to the point where they're having a really quick win. Eighteen months later, a uh, multinational or a U.S. A Delaware Corp. wants to buy them have you seen have you gone through any instances of an exit and having the lawyers and the accountants figure out how to merge uh, you know a, a prosperin company into an acquiring us company uh, if not you know do you do you understand sort of like what that might look like and whether that will be like some you know silicon valley palo alto lawyer scratching their head and said we haven't seen one of these before or how do you anticipate those kinds of things will go you know of course knock on wood there will be many many successes what does that look like from an exit perspective? Sure. Yeah. So what I'm saying is not legal advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. Right. So uh, h- how it works in practice right now is that most startups that use Prosper jurisdiction also have Delaware C-Corps, simply because that's the vehicle that most US VCs require and have agreed on, right? So you'd lose a lot of market access if you didn't have that option. Right, so a Prosper LLC endows you with more flexibility to certain things and it has certain advantages. So I, for example, I have my Delaware fund owned by a holding company that's based in Prospera, right? Which is totally possible because it's my personal wealth building vehicle, right? So nobody's investing in that entity. I just hold it. And then people are investing in like the Delaware entities and you could do the same thing as a startup, right? What I'm trialing out now with Vitalia is we have a Prosper LLC and we do saves that are made for the Prosper jurisdiction, right? So we're specifically for this one talking to investors who are already aligned and are willing to take on that risk, right? But as a backup option, we still have the Delaware C Corp, right? So if we have someone that really doesn't want to, then it goes into the Delaware C Corp and the shares are kind of mirroring or reflecting what's happening in one entity as, as part of the other. And then there's also a fallback legal option that we're putting together right now that if something were to happen to the Prosper entity for some reason, then it would just be swapped into a Delaware entity, right? So that interoperability already exists, right? So um, that's how I think about it as a company. And one thing I'll add there is that you know, I've, I've mentioned that the Prosper legal framework is innovative and the first of its kind in many ways. But we're also borrowing from best practices in other places. So the actual legal vehicle structure in Prospera for LLCs or corporations, for the large part, mirrors what you'd see in Delaware, which has kind of emerged as the standard. And so um, our goal is to make it as familiar as possible. Uh, It's a common law legal environment based primarily on a restatement of common law. And so um, the, the goal is to make it familiar so that it's also interoperable for those sorts of transactions. But at the same time, of course, there's advantages, right? And these advantages, they're very specific to what you're trying to do, right? So you mentioned like the mini circle gene therapy example. Uh, Another thing that could be interesting, which is why the November 3 to 5 conference is called Crypto Futures and Legal Engineering, right? So there's kind of a new field in Web3 that's merging kind of computer science with law, right? So crypto lawyers around the LexDAO legal guild are organizing it together with us. They're kind of recognizing or seeing that law is in many ways like code, right? So it's not that one can fully replace the other, but when you look at these inter-jurisdictional uh, things and when you look at what 
blockchain technology can do right, in terms of making contracts, like for example, tokenizing reward assets. These are legal contracts, right? And blockchain is kind of a settlement layer for legal contracts. So in the Prosper jurisdiction, this can, can give you a lot more flexibility. You know, again, not legal advice. And um, there is, as you know, things you have to be very uh, careful with things that touch Americans or the United States when it comes to anything crypto or anything that the SEC could fall under in terms of jurisdictions. But there are options, um, you know, especially, at least if you're not American, to like have a prosper entity kind of as a wrapper around another entity. And then the prosper entity can be tokenized, for example. So there's all sorts of really interesting things and proposals that came up in the last couple of conferences, how you could use that Prospera LLC structure flexibility. Yeah, I feel like there's a whole other podcast episode that we don't necessarily have time for around really drilling down on the the quote unquote nerdy stuff around you know, how do you create civil litigation framework? How do you create banking? How do you create all like all of the kind of recreating society from scratch? And I know it's not it's not from scratch. It's standing on the the shoulders of giants and creating and recreating some of these frameworks. Um, but we we don't have time for all that. But I've got a long list of notes of kind of really specific topics I want to drill down in and maybe someday you can come back on the pod. As we get to the end of the hour, though, I almost I want to kind of put it out there. Um, I'm trying to picture the future of uh, network societies and vertical and horizontal network uh, network societies. Um, it, do you have a sense of where in the world? I mean, I'm not holding you to it. Don't share any secrets that you know about anything or anything under an NDA. But in general, where should we expect more of these to be created in the world? Are there uh, Montenegro is where Zuzalu was was created. Do we expect many of these on the Adriatic coast in the Balkans? Like it's rumored that where Praxis might be identifying their their city site. Is it Central America? Will we see these in Western Europe? Where might the next five or ten? Almost like if I could do a lightning round of like top three countries that are really good at this and entertaining these kinds of ideas. I, I'm trying to picture where it's all going to pop up and. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on, you know, where should we expect more of this in the world? Yeah, I would say generally South America and Africa, right? So in South America, besides Honduras, and hopefully the program will be continued, the ZEDI program, you also have countries like Uruguay. So Uruguay has very advanced special economic zones, and also Panama and Costa Rica have, for example. And I heard that Colombia is thinking about doing these zones. And then in Africa, this is kind of where the most need is for urbanization, right? So I was involved with Zanzibar. There is already two projects and the government is very open to do more of those. And there is private cities also in Kenya um, and in Nigeria. There's two interesting or several interesting projects. One, for example, is led by Inuluba Abuyeji, um, the biggest tech entrepreneur in Africa. He's building his own network of charter cities starting in a free zone in Nigeria. Jay, any thoughts on where the future is? Uh, we got South America and Africa, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I would echo Nicholas's comments for the most part. And obviously, our, our primary focus right now is Honduras because it is the biggest opportunity. And we're focused on building out that initial success case. I will mention, because I'm an American, and a lot of our community are Americans, um, you know, there's always a, an interest where people say, can we do something here? And, you know, there have been efforts around that in the past, around regulatory sandboxes in certain places, interstate compacts, working with Indian reservations. Um, there are some opportunities there, but I think it's just it's 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 very, very much in its infancy until there's that really big success case that that makes the the value of a zone like that undeniable for a country like the United States. It doesn't necessarily need it. But, yeah, I'd agree that right now, Latin America. Um, is, is where we're focused and obviously in Honduras to build out the initial success case. Well, Jay and Nicholas, this uh, really just feels like scratching the, cir uh, scratching the surface of a first ever conversation I'm having with you that just leads to 10 other subtopics for me to go and research. We'll, we'll definitely get a, a, a comprehensive list of links for the show notes, but just briefly for our listeners, uh, where can they go to find more information about Prospera or about your fund, Nicholas, uh, if they're just searching on the internet? And then we'll we'll make sure, if, even if you have more social handles, we'll add them all. But uh, where should they go first if they're looking for you? Sure, infinitavc.com. So there you find a collection of tons of links and content, including my podcast and my blog, 
right on the blog, for example, you find the ultimate guide for entrepreneurs to prosper, um, kind of summarizing all my practical insights that uh, touch on many of the questions that you asked that you asked here. And also the podcast already has more than 70 episodes now and has like very prominent thinkers like Robin Hanson or Alex Tabarrok. Um, and additionally, on top of that, I'm very active on Twitter and on LinkedIn mostly. Yeah, and for Prospera, you can find us on X at Prospera Global. Our website is prospera.co. And there are a couple of big links there on the top of the page. The first is join. Uh, you can click there to join our City Builders Network. Uh, that's the online gathering place for the community where you can see all the latest updates, projects, events that are happening. So you can plug into one of these events that, that Nicholas is hosting. And then there's uh, also a tab there for visit. So you can see what the city looks like. You can see pictures, uh, tips for visiting, sign up there. We can give you a tour when you come down and uh, give you the concierge experience to visit the city for yourself. Jay, Nicholas, thanks for coming on the pod. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank